OK, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Xiao Yilu. I come from the Ohio State University. I'm a research scientist uh, uh, doing the research in big data and cloud computing. So today, I'm so happy to present this talk here. Uh, the main reason is because so many of you come to listen to my talk. Thanks a lot. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, I apologize that my co-presenter, co Dr. DK Panda, because of some personal uh, constraints at the last minute, he couldn't come. So I will present the whole talk. So this talk is about accelerating big data processing and the framework provisioning with OpenStack, Heat-based Hadoop, and Spark. So these days, I mean, uh, all of us talking about big data, which is a big problem, a lot of challenges. The main reason is because uh, the data is, is growing so fast. For example, let's say uh, every day when we click our website, we use our smartphone or our operations, we are generate data. And this data needs to be st stored, analyzed, and processed. That's why the big data becomes a big problem. It, and actually, this problem is not, is not only occurred for industry or business domains. It, it also happening for the scientific or uh, uh, research domains. They say there's these days a lot of scientific big data problems as well. So to some extent, the big data, big data becomes like a, uh, the, the speed of big data growing. Uh, some, these days, like a, we, we, we see it almost high, faster or higher than the uh, more slow. So in order to process this big data in a fast and a scalable manner, so a lot of people started trying to converging big data and the high performance computing technologies to meet this, this type of challenges, to solve this type of challenges. And on the other, on the other hand, running high performance data analytics workloads on top of cloud is also gaining uh, popularity. Let's say, uh, according to latest OpenStack survey, there are around almost 30% of the cloud deployments are running HPD, HPDA workloads. So when we talk about big data, so if we, if we look, at, look from the system perspective, what kind of solutions, or what kind of technologies these days people are using, are using to, solve big data, uh, to solve big data problems, to run big data applications? So broadly, we define into two tiers. One is the front tier, one is the back end tier. The front, tier, front end tier is just like the example I mentioned earlier. Every day, if you, if you click on the website, you use your smartphone, or your click screen will go to the front end tier uh, servers. Let's say web server, like a database server or long SQL DB server kind of things. And then this data will get stored, get processed there, and then it also go back to the back end storage. Here we give example like HDFS. So probably you can also use Ceph or Orange GFS, some other kind of file systems. And then on top of that, people typically run some kind of machine learning, data mining, deep learning kind of workloads on top of it. So here I gave two examples, like one is MapReduce, one is Spark so that you can run your algorithms in a scale-out scale fashion on top of distributed file system. So how many of you are familiar about MapReduce? Can you please raise your hand? OK, great. There's so many people uh, familiar with that. So just, just let everybody in the same page. I just quickly give a, uh, some high-level view what kind of ideas of MapReduce so that later on people can understand my talk uh, easily. So broadly for MapReduce, just like here the diagram shows, uh, you, have a, you have a big problem, you written with some, uh, your user-level user program code, and then there is a kind of master worker kind of architecture, and then this program will launch, and the master will assign the task to different kind of data splits, and then you run map tasks on each of the split, and then the output of a map task will get shuffled to the reduce phase. This is the reduce task, and then this, ta this Map output will get gathered and aggregated, processed, and then output to the distributed file system. So this kind of defined conquer architecture. So during this phase, a lot of problems can get solved in a fault tolerant and scalable fashion. This, some, this is just like example. You have a you have a lot of tasks to to do to be done by yourself, but you have a lot of friends, good friends. So one way you can do is you can do it by yourself, which is sequential manner which is not scalable, which is not high performance. But you can also like, assign your tasks to good, good friends, right? And then let's say you have 10 friends, and then each of them help you a little, then you can get like a, ideally you can get a 10 times improvement. That's some example behind the MapReduce. This, hopefully this is easier to help you to understand. Okay, this is for MapReduce. Let's take a look at the concrete example. Like here is word count. Let's say you have, you, if you have this file, this file is small, so you can write any kind of program to solve it. But think about if this file is like one terabyte or one petabyte. If you want to do work on this file, then this problem becomes hard. 
right? Especially if you consider about fault tolerance, okay? Especially because if some task get failed, then how you handle it uh, properly? So like I said earlier, for example, the flow of MapReduce is like this. So you divide this file into multiple splits or partition. And then you run your map task. Each map task will take over one file and process on it. And then the output gets shuffled to the reduce phase. And then you reduce these to aggregation and the output to the uh, in the HDFS or other file systems. So in this way, the huge problem becomes to the simpler problems and get solved. Okay? So this is the idea behind that. Why these days Hadoop is so popular? That's the one reason of making problems solved easily and, fa and fast and also scalable. And another perspective is about productivity or programming. Think about if you write this word, this word count example by yourself. If you use MPI, PGAS, or other kind of language, you need to write a lot of code, especially if you want to handle one, one, petabyte, one petabyte or one zettabyte of data. But for Hadoop MapReduce, these days, you can only write 63 lines of code, okay? The same code you can run on any kind of data sets without any changes, okay? That's why these days Hadoop is so popular for, uh, especially for the uh, developers or engineers who is trying to def do some fast, like idea implementation and, and, and see the result, how the result come out and they're trying to change their solution. So, and also like I said, it can be run scalable manner and, and fault tolerant productivity. Okay, this is the Hadoop. So some of you may also be uh, familiar with Spark or heard of Spark, right? Now this example, same example, becomes even simpler in Spark. How many lines now? Three. Okay, so that's why Spark is, is, is getting momentum these days. A lot of people trying to use Spark. Okay, this is one of the reasons. See, you can easily define your file in HDFS, you can also change it to Taycan or other file systems, okay? This is your Spark file, they say RDD, if you, some of you heard of this concept. And then you can do like, a, based on this file, you get each line and then do a split, and then you just uh, uh, count in the uh, occurrence of each word, and then you save the output to the HDFS. So this is the idea of the Spark. You get three lines, this code is all very, is even more uh, productivity you can get, and then it's scalable, for tolerant as well as high performance, okay? The high performance, the reason of high performance is because this Hadoop is being developed or designed for like uh, batch processing. But in many scenario, your workloads may be iterate, have it, uh, you will run iteratively, right? And also interactively. So Spark will, ha will save all this data or all this in the memory, I mean, so that you can repeatedly uh, run your programs on top of it. So let me give an example, another more concrete example or complex example. Word count is too simple. Maybe some of you say that, okay, that's, 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 that doesn't mean anything, right? Now let's uh, take a look at the log mining. So let's say when, if we are developers, we always want to do what? We, have, we write our code, we see some errors, we're trying to debug, uh, or you're trying to see uh, what kind of errors, what kind of problem happening behind the system. So one way is like do log mining, right? So typically when we do log mining, we, we can use Linux here, we do grab, we do uh, like a card or, 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 or sort kind of things to, to find what, what's the problem actually. And then in Spark, they say how we can do it. When, when we think of this uh, scenario, think about your data is huge, not only one file. You have like a thousands of tens of thousands of files st stored in your cluster, how you can do that efficiently, okay? So this is the uh, architecture of running Spark applications on top of your cluster. You have like a driver or a master uh, node, and then you have the worker nodes, like a distributed fashion. And then first of all, you, you say that, okay, where's my file? You, 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 you get the file from the HDFS. And then we call it base RDD, can uh, load it into memory. And then just like we do grip, we do like we say, okay, for this file, we just want to select the lines and each line start with arrow because we're trying to see what happening for the error part, right? And then this we call transform RDD. And then after that, we say that error is not, error is just a tag, right? We, we actually want error message. So we do a split, we get error message from the second field, let's say. And then we, because we want, to, we want to find the reason, so it may not just one run, right? We want to repeatedly 
to hand, uh, to like uh, uh, analyze this data. So we want to cache the da this data into the memory. So the next time I run some other uh, commands or run other some instructions, it can run in memory speed. So we do a cache, and then now we want to see how many time, how many times, or how many uh, lines related with foo this type of event or anything else you can define, and then we do a count. So now let's see how this get uh, executed. So then Spark will get these lines and then he's trying to submit the jobs to the cluster, okay? And it's like a map reduce. This task will be assigned to different nodes and each node will take a piece of data and analyze for you. Okay, this is like a scalable. And then get the results back to the driver program and then you get the output, okay? You get the results. So this is how it gets executed. This is exactly like a map reduce, but the interesting part is next one. So because we say cache, okay? So this output or some earlier phase results can be cached in the memory. And the next time we want to say that, how about another, if, another uh, message or like a bar or anything else you, can, you, can, you, can, you, want, to, you want to search or you want to analyze. So this, this, the second line, this one will be executed in the cached dataset so that you get much faster than Hadoop, okay? So this is the uh, like a design principle or ideas behind the Spark. Let's just give some uh, high-level results. They say for based on uh, Databricks numbers, they say that a full text search on Wikipedia data around 60 GB on 20 EC2 uh, machines is only about 0 0.5 second compared if you do this search on top of disk. On top of this is about 20, sec 20 seconds, this 0 0.5 second. Think about if you can, whether you write other programs, you can do like 0 0.5 second full text search on Wikipedia data. Okay, another one, the same program can scale to the one terabyte of data in about five to seven seconds, okay? But if you do on disk, it's about 170 seconds. That's the idea of in-memory computing these days. Uh, people are trying to be bring into the big data uh, middleware. Okay, so this is just some background overview so that the, the, so that people can understand what I'm going to talk in, uh, in this outline, okay? So I want to tell you guys what kind of challenges of make this processing uh, paradigm even faster with HPC technologies, what kind of bottlenecks are there, okay? And then I also want to introduce what kind of work we have, we have done in our group. We call it High Performance Big Data Project, uh, like short for high BD. And then we'll introduce some kind of basic designs, like going, going deep, what kind, what kind of designs we can propose with, with high performance networks. And also we, because this big cloud com, uh, community, right, we want to see that what kind of opportunities we can further optimize for big data libraries on top of cloud. So we'll introduce something like a cloud where we already may have to processing, okay? And then in tomorrow's talk, I have another two talks. In tomorrow's one, I will introduce how to bring RDMA technology into OpenStack Swift to make it even faster. And then uh, we also want to say that because in cloud environment, how to deploy your application as fast as possible is another big challenge. So in, thanks to the OpenStack uh, community, the heat component we think is very uh, useful to help us to deploy this whole stack because you see big data middleware, so many layers from the underneath one to the like a fire system to, to the, your MapReduce, Hadoop, your two applications, so many layers, so many dependencies, how to deploy it efficiently, right? That's a big challenge. Okay, now let's take a look. What kind of opportunities first in these days, especially for high performance computing uh, domain, high performance cluster or cloud architectures? So when, when, whenever we go to high HPC cluster or supercomputer these days, we see every node is multi-core, many core kind of technologies. You have very high uh, performance Xeon, uh, Xeon cores or Xeon fine Xeon, uh, or GPG views. And then also these days you have a lot of memory or uh, large memory nodes, one terabyte, mem one terabyte memory nodes, also very popular, right? So, and also SSD, MVRAN, Power Life Systems, and object, uh, object storage. This kind of different storage uh, technologies also available in the, in the cloud in, uh, and also HPC uh, clusters. There's another two important techn technologies I want to introduce here. One is 
RDMA enabled networking. Two examples, InfiniBand and Rocky. How many of you uh, use this uh, network? Okay, few of you, okay. Another important technology is we call the single root IO virtualization. How many of you heard of this? Okay, a lot, good, that's because we are cloud. <laughs> okay, so let me introduce uh, these two, just in uh, two or three slides. In this slide, we're just going to overview or summarize what kind of communication protocols or what kind of communication mechanisms or network you can use these days in your HPC cloud or HPC cluster, okay? From the left side is the one with a very uh, familiar, like TCP IP over Ethernet, over Ethernet driver, Ethernet adapter, and Ethernet switch, right? This we, we start learning this from uh, when we are students. So this has been used in many, many domains, like all the big data middlewares these days, if you see or everything de uh, developed on top of sockets and then running with TCP IP stack. But if you take a look at the right side, the right side is something, it's very exciting because it gives you much, much faster performance than the left side, which is called RDMA technology. I will introduce our, what is RDMA later. So basically, it, 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 it doesn't use sockets uh, API anymore. It will use verbs, APIs, and then it will use RDMA technologies and they go through the user level communication protocol and running with InfiniBand adapter and InfiniBand switch. Okay, so that, this will give you a lot of benefit. What kind of benefit? Let's take a look at these slides. So I want to introduce a little bit about why RDMA is important these days and why it can give you good performance. Think about, think about send and receive first before I introduce uh, RDMA. Send and receive means what? Receiver side, post receive. Sender side, post send. And then the network communication for you, and then in the receiver side, do a match and go to, the, go to your memory, right? This is like a two-sided communication. Each side needs to be involved. That's why you cannot achieve best performance, okay? Because each side needs to be involved. Your CPU resources, a lot of things need to be participated in the communication process. Now somebody, some smart guy saying that, okay, can we do one-sided communication? Okay, if I, if I know I, want, I will communicate with you, why I, I cannot directly write the data into your memory? Because in a single node, you, you probably heard, I think all of us should know DMA, right? DMA means what? You write into the memory without CPU involvement. And then somebody said, okay, can we do this in a remote fashion? I can write to somebody which I trust, or you trust me. I can directly write to your memory, so that whatever you're doing, you continue, right? I don't, you don't have to be involved in the communication process. That's called one-sided communication or RDMA technology. Okay, now let me give elimination. So let's say this is sender side, this is receiver side, okay? So the sender said that I'm trying to send the data to the receiver, okay? This is the data in the memory. And then the infinity band card will, be smart, will smartly take your data directly right into the remote memory location, okay? So this is called remote direct memory access, okay? So that in this, and the hardware acknowledgement, everything will be handled by the uh, NIC as well. So take a look at this phase. The initiator process is involved only for post, send, descriptor, and also pull out the complication queue from the complication, complication, uh, uh, complication event from the uh, complication queue, right? But for the receiver side, the CPU is not involved at all, okay? So this is the major idea behind RDMA. Okay, so if we want to bring these, thing, these technologies into cloud, another technology is needed, which is called single root IO virtualization, SRV, okay? The idea is that because earlier, if we, if we are familiar with uh, IO virtualization or networking virtualization, typically we do what? We do front-end driver, back-end driver, and then we do the software-based kind of virtualization, right? That's good, but like you lose performance. The reason is because each packet, you need to come back and forth from different layers, and then there's a lot of overhead. So in the community, people trying to solve that problem by proposing single root IO virtualization, this gives a lot of new opportunities to design high-performance uh, communication IO middleware for big data and other workloads. 
The basic idea is this. So now this, this if the independent card or other uh, SRV supported uh, PCI device can present itself like multiple for two functions in the hardware layer, okay? And then the hypervisor, when we, when we launch the virtual machines, and the each, we can select each of the virtual functions and then map it directly into the guest, guest OS. So that this guest, like, for, from this guest OS perspective, it seems like that it can dedicatedly use the hardware directly, okay? That's why SRV give you a lot of opportunities because the performance get improved a lot, okay? So InfiniBand now these days also support SRV technologies and also other kind of high performance Ethernet like 10 gig or 40 gig uh, Ethernet. So with this, let's take a look. If you want to build efficient cloud with SRV and InfiniBand, InfiniBand or high performance networks like Rocky, uh, iWarp give you a lot of opportunities for good performance. Let's say low latency, few microseconds now these days. And high bandwidth with InfiniBand HDR card, you can achieve 200 Gbps these days, okay? And very low CPU overhead, like I said, because the re remote side or the receiver side, the CPU is not involved in the, in the receive phase, right? So that you only need like five to 10% of the CPU involvement. It gives a lot of a chance to do the overlapping of your complication, complication in the I.O. And then uh, all of this like op open fabric software stack like OFET is, pop is very popularly, is very popular used in many uh, HPC systems and also it's open source. Uh, people can use it directly. Now the question is how to build efficient clouds with SRV in Filiband to deliver near optimal performance or near bare metal performance in, in the cloud. That's the overall problem I want, we want to uh, solve in this talk. And then particularly for big data middlewares. So we want to solve a lot, uh, some kind of challenge like this. So these days, like, like I mentioned earlier, big data middleware, by default, they are developed and designed with sockets, TCP IP kind of communication protocols. But because RDMA is, is showing so good features or so good performance, why we cannot use it? But the challenge is what? Our design is written with sockets. It's using standard default Java libraries or something like that how you can use verbs, right? That's some of kind of challenges. And also we have, these days, not only DRAM based complication, these days like NVRAN is also available, what kind of NVRAN uh, based aware complication IO schemes can, can help. And, and how to use like a different kind of SSD, SADA, PCIe, NVMe, parallel file system support, optimized overlapping, different thread models and the synchronization and the locality aware designs. Because in cloud, a lot of different layers like virtual machines, containers, your, your task is no longer just running on top of native nodes. You are running inside, inside some containers, some environments. You have to aware of the underneath architecture or underneath network topology. topology. And uh, for tolerance, residency, efficient data access placement, is, uh, efficient task scheduling, fast deployment, all kinds of issues we want to see uh, what kind of designs we can propose. Okay. So this, this slide showed, showed that what kind of challenges we have, we have addressed so far. So these applications, this big data middleware, we have do a lot of designs with HDFS, MapLoose, Spark, HBase, Memory Cache, and extra. And then in this layer, we call the resource management the scheduling systems for cloud, like uh, OpenStack, Swift, or Heat kind of systems, definitely Nova, uh, those components are there. And then for the complication, the IO library, the most important thing is RDMA and SRV, how to utilize that, how to get better designs in, inside uh, big data middleware. Locality aware communication, fertilization, data placement kind of things. Okay, so now let's take a look the concrete designs or concrete things we have done in our group. So this is just overview of what we have done. So first of all, we take Hadoop and Spark as examples. We optimize that with RDMA technologies. We have developed RDMA for Apache Spark RDMA for Hadoop 2.x series. We actually started with 0.20, I think, and then we, we, we keep, up, we keep up upgrading our designs to 1.0 series, 2.0 series, and also some of you may familiar that in the big data community, there's some kind of funders distributions, like uh, Hortonworks, Cloudera distributions. We also design some plugin-based uh, components so that you can integrate, integrate it with your HTTP or CDH distributions. 
And then some people are trying to use like a NoSQL database. So we, we take the HBase uh, as an example application uh, framework. So we, we bring RDMA into it. And the, like for key value stores, these days memory cached or like Redis, Rocks, DB kind of things, also very popular. We bring RDMA into memory cached, see what kind of benefits uh, people can achieve from the RDMA protocol, okay? So we have, we have a large user base right now. We have like 225 uh, organizations from 30, 60, uh, 30 countries and more than 21,000 uh, downloads from our project side. This, this solution can run with InfiniBand as well as Rocky, but if you have, but if you have only have Ethernet, it can also run as well. Okay, this is like a superset of the default version. Okay, for uh, for Hadoop 2.x uh, distribution, what we have, what the latest version we support is uh, Hadoop 2.7.3. Okay, this is almost the uh, uh, latest one. The this day is 2.8 is coming, so we are trying, we are working on uh, merging to it. We are we'll make a new release in the next uh, uh, several weeks, uh, maybe. So we have very good designs like RDMA-based HDFS, RDMA MapReduce, RDMA-based RPC kind of things. Okay, it can also run MapReduce directly on top of Luster or other uh, parallel five systems without HDFS involvement. We can also try, we can also run these workloads on top of uh, burst buffer based design. For example, we, in our group, we, de we develop some burst buffer on top of memory cached so that you can run your workloads on top of, the, on top of burst buffer layer, okay? So this is like a different, different uh, modes we support with, uh, in our uh, Hadoop library. So for HDFS side, we can support purely like uh, in-memory mode. We, we are trying to help you get in-memory speed for I.O., okay? But it, it may uh, lose some fault tolerance. But in some cases, if you want to have performance, uh, then this may be a, a one mode you can try. And then heterogeneous mode, like HHH, we call it Triple H, and then with last three integrated mode, Triple HL, and then with bus burst buffer, Triple H L B B. And then for MapReduce, we have, we have different, uh, two modes as well. You run with uh, HDFS or you run with Luster. Another thing is for HPC clusters, we, de we develop some kind of tools to integrate Hadoop with your scheduler, HPC cluster schedulers, like SNRN or PBS or Tokyo. Okay, for Spark, similarly, for Spark, uh, we have developed uh, uh, some designs inside it. I will give some uh, deeper uh, overview of what we've done uh, in the next several slides. And then this is the latest version 2.1.0 Apache Spark. We support that with RDMA. And then these packages available in our website is also available in uh, supercomputers or uh, cloud. For example, SDSC command, if you have XSD account, you should be able to uh, log in to commit and run our work, uh, packages. And also we have developed appliance which are available in community cloud. This is OpenStack based cloud supported by NSF. Okay, now let's take a look at the base designs. What kind of challenges we solved through RDMA. So first of all in HDFS, because HDFS is a major component widely used by a lot of big data middlewares like Spark, Flink, or HBase, everything. Then we take a look what kind of uh, communication requirements or IO requirements actually HDFS need, okay? So then we do a lot of analysis. We see that the most communication the IO intensity path is what? It's not, it's not read, because read, there's a locality, right? Actually, it's write. Because when you do write, you need to go, because of the four tolerance report, you have to do replication. When you do replication, your data has have to be moved right, to different nodes, okay? During that phase, is, you need to consume network. You need to, cons you need to use a lot of high-speed IO device as well, right? So that's why we bring RDMA first into the HDFS write pass and also the replication pass, okay? That's, we call it RDMA-based HDFS write and the replication. Okay, not only that, because if you just improve the complication part, the bottleneck may, may still exist on the IO pass, right? Because you have to load it up from disk and then send to the network. If the bottleneck in the disk exists, even you have high performance networks, it still doesn't help. You, see, you, you have to improve your IO pass as well. So that's why we bring some other designs to efficiently utilize heterogeneous storage devices like SSD, RAM disk, MVRAM kind of things, 
when also we do hybrid replication kind of technologies. We have a paper in uh, CISGRID 2015. If you have interest, please feel free to take a look. That's for HDFS. And for MapReduce, I re for the earlier, I, I gave an example of how MapReduce works, right? Just record that. Where is communication? Where is communication? Where you need communication? Shuffle, right? You have some output from map, map face. You want to transfer this map, map, out, uh, map, map output to the reduced tasks. Then how you transfer, how you move those data? You have to use network. That also communication intensive phase, okay? So that's why we, first of all, we, we design our DMA based shuffle. Not only that, similarly, if you need to get data every time from disk and then do the shuffle, it's still slow. So that's why we, bring, we design some prefetching and caching of your map output. And then we do in memory merge rather than on disk merge. Okay, so with all these kind of designs, we are trying to improve your application. We in a, I mean, you know, much, running in a much, much faster manner. And another goal is don't change your application. Everything we done is in the middleware, in the library, so that your application can run transparently. That's the major goal. Now let's take a look at some of the perform example performance numbers. So this is like a, a Apache Hadoop a random writer Taylor gene on top of uh, if Infinity Band EDR 100 GPS. We see that around 3x or 4x performance improvement. Next one is sort and tear sort. Maximally, we can achieve like around 60% improvement. Okay, now let's take a look. Another one, let's take a look at Spark. In Spark, similarly, even though Spark is, tr is trying to uh, bring your data processing in memory, but still, when the wide dependency happens, you still need to bring your data from different nodes. The other phase, we still call shuffle. It's still time consuming, complication intensive, and IO intensive. So what we bring is, in default Spark, you have like NIO or native based components. We, are bring, we bring the RDMA based, compo, RDMA based plugin designs under in the Spark core. So with this, we are able to see around 80% improvement for RDD based operations, this group by and sort by. This basic RDD operation, very simple micro benchmark. And then for next one is graph benchmark, which is page rank. So we run uh, up to 1,536 cores for subscription on 64 uh, worker nodes on SD's Comet. This is another, this is a supercomputer. We can, we can achieve around 40% performance improvement. Okay, so that's like just like a bike benchmark or benchmark. So these days people are also trying to run deep learning on top of Spark. One of the example is big deal, is developed by Intel. So basically they are running parameter server kind of architecture. Okay, they run their deep learning models on top of Spark, and then the data will get shuffled through uh, the back end of Spark. Okay, there are a lot of uh, interesting features for uh, big deal. If you have interest, please feel free to go to this link, take a look at the, uh, uh, their uh, features and the user guide. We want, to, we want to show some earlier numbers we observed. This is just for one EPO, uh, Com computation uh, phase, we see that with RDMA, this VG VGG training, mo training model on top of CFR10 dataset, we are able to see like around 4x performance improvement. That's very exciting for deep learning workloads. Just bring RDMA into your stack, okay? So that's for native environment or bare metal environment. Now let's take a look how to run RDMA Hadoop on top of cloud. Lot of challenges here also, right? What kind of performance characteristics of your uh, native uh, of your RDMA pass on top of SRV channels? What kind of locality aware designs you can bring, and how to detect uh, the cl cluster, the cloud topology, and uh, how to design some virtualization fertil aware policies in Hadoop, and how to bring these things into the Hadoop stack. So this is the. Dimensions, we actually can uh, try to learn or try to design, uh, to explore the designs uh, of, to utilize HPC cloud networking technologies. You have different network architecture, for example, we have QDR, 4 gig these days, or 4 gig Rocky, FDR, EDR. From this dimension, you have like a different protocols. You can run TCP IP, you can run IP over IP, you can run RC, UD, or hybrid, whatever. And then you, you can run with SRV, you can run with a bare metal environment. And then how to design your stack to consider all these kind of different generation of architectures and the protocols. So we just give one example. Because RPC is being used for in many big data middlewares, for example, HBase, right? 
So this default path, you can run Java, you can run default edge base or RPC or top of TCP IP over UDP or TCP protocol. You can also run with IPLB with RC or UD. And then, like I said earlier, we are running, we designed RDMA based protocol, right? For big data middleware. We want to try that. Can this design take advantage of multi-channel or multi-protocols? For example, like RC, UD, or hybrid. Okay? So we design uh, we design some kind of protocols. We can hybrid RC and the UD protocol because RC can support RDMA, but UD cannot. But the UD can help you that reduce memory utilization because you can you only need one peer to complicate it with uh, one EP to communicate with all the peers. Now let's take a look at performance. If you take a look at this, the red one is the IB with uh, uh, with uh, RC. So we see that that's the best performance we can achieve. And then this one for HBase. The maximally we see around 2.6x performance improvement, okay, with the best pro best protocol selection. And uh, for Hadoop, similarly, uh, for diff for different components for HDFS, we design block uh, management to improve fault tolerance. For Yarn, we design some container allocation policy uh, policy to reduce network network traffic. MapReduce Hadoop components. For Hadoop Common, we design some topology detection middleway uh, modular to automatically detect your topology of your cluster. We integrate these designs into the uh, RDMA Hadoop. If you want to take a look at some numbers, we see that for color burst and the self join applications, maximally we can reduce the screen time around 55%. Okay, that's some kind of designs we provide. Now let's see how to uh, do the fast provisioning. So like I said, OpenStar HID can help this phase. So this is the HID architecture. We want to get some physical node, and then we launch VMs, in the launch VMs, we need to handle a lot of things. For example, SRV channel, setup, networking setting, image management, launch VMs, and the mount global storage. These kind of requirements are there, okay? But with heat, we actually can design all these things in a, in a template manner, right? We can write these things in a heat uh, configuration file, and then heat can take over all these kind of things, like a load VM config, allocate ports, allocate floating IP, generate SQ, key, blah, blah, blah and then it will develop the whole Hadoop stack and the, and the Spark stack for you. This is just a quick demo uh, on top of OpenStack. So this kind, uh, we first create a list, and then with this, one important thing is we, you need the independent support. Independent support here. Because we run with RDMA, right? And then this is the stack uh, with heat. So we, we, we need to select what is the list, what is the recipe key, and uh, how many total physical nodes you need, how many total VMs you need, and then how many virtual CPUs for each VM. And uh, yes, uh, this kind of things. And then you, do, you click launch, and then this whole uh, cluster will, develop for, uh, will deploy it for you automatically. And then this is, uh, this is the phase, uh, you get launched directly. And then this is the overview of the uh, stack details. And then in the output, actually, there's the important thing is that we were directly automatically assign a floating IP on your uh, master node so that you can access this cluster through this public IP wherever, uh, you, on whatever you, uh, cloud, uh, uh, termi uh, terminals or SSH, through SSH. So we have a lot of um, going f uh, plans on, on this project. We are we're trying to uh, upgrade to latest version of Hadoop Spark. We are also trying to support streaming, uh, do automatic tuning, Impala, Swift, and uh, deep learning with that. With this, let me conclude this talk. So first of all, I'm trying to give an overview of what kind of challenges of accelerating big data processing with HPC and the cloud technologies. We present a lot of uh, designs or opportunities to take advantage of our RDMA and SRV. I don't, I mean, it may be hard to get all this information in just the 40 minutes talk, but feel free to come to me and we can discuss in offline. And we have a lot of materials in the website as well, so please feel free to take a look. Uh, all the results look promising, and the one important thing is that this kind of stack is very complicated. If you want to deploy it by yourself, it's very hard, but with OpenStack Heat, you're able to deploy it easily, especially we share this template on the, on the website. You can easily use that and then deploy it. And then all these things, we are trying to enable big data, community, uh, big, big data and the cloud computing community to take advantage of modern HPC technologies to carry out their analytics with high-performance uh, manner. So I have two more talks. Tomorrow at 4.30, I will introduce what we have done in, inside OpenStack Swift to bring RDMA into it. 
Second thing is the, the day after tomorrow, we'll introduce how to build efficient HPC clouds with MPI, OpenStack, over SRV and RDMA, and also how to support migration. So uh, just acknowledgement the, the, the uh, sponsors. So we are uh, seeking for more opportunities uh, from you guys. And then this is the uh, acknowledgement to the personnel from our group. Thank you a lot. <laughs>